So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about first-generation hormone therapies. Now, as we all know, when someone's diagnosed with prostate cancer, it's a very confusing world, and I think oftentimes patients are prescribed a certain type of hormone therapy from their physician, but they haven't heard about all the other options, and then when they do hear about them, it can kind of cause this issue of, oh, wait, does that one work better? You know, what do the studies say? Should I be on that one? Is it cheaper? Affordability? There's a lot of questions that this opens up. So I was wondering if you could, you know, go into the first generation hormone therapies, explains which each one is, and then talk about really the comparisons. Is one going to work better and some patients more than others? Yeah, sure. Happy to do that. The different products that we're going to talk about ultimately are all supposed to do the same thing. They're all supposed to suppress testosterone release from the testicles and get testosterone levels in the blood down to very low levels. All of the different uh, medicines, uh, Lupron, Orgovix, Firmagon, Trellstar, Eligard, Zolodex, and uh, I may be missing some of them, but all these medicines do the same thing. They all cause the testicles to stop making testosterone. Now, there are a few differences in how quickly the testosterone level drops down to zero. Uh, in Orgovix and Firmagon, there's a more precipitous decline, whereas with the other products that I mentioned, you can have even a brief rise in testosterone for a few days before the testosterone drops down to zero. Does that really make a difference? In most cases, it doesn't. It could matter if someone had uh, was embarking upon these medicines with very advanced, out-of-control prostate cancer. Say their PSA is 500 and their bones are hurting. The last thing you want to do is give them a shot and have their testosterone go up for a week. That's a bad idea. But most of the men these days are coming into the medical realm with a PSA of five, and they're getting uh, a biopsy, and there's some discussion about maybe adding some hormones to their radiation. In that setting, a, a week or two of a testosterone rise isn't gonna make any difference at all. The similarities are much greater than the differences between the different products that we're discussing. Before I get to my next question on hormone therapy, I just wanted to remind you, we're a nonprofit organization, and our goal is to get these videos out to millions of men across the world. If you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to this video on first generation hormone therapies. So when patients are researching treatments or they're either hearing it from their physician, there's conversations around toxicity or what we call side effects. So are there more side effects in one drug than another in this category? Not really. The medicines themselves, and this is always a, you know interesting thing when you're talking about any kind of pharmaceutical uh, for whatever purpose, is the pharmaceutical, uh, when you block testosterone, that has all kinds of side effects. But the medicines themselves that I mentioned already, I uh, don't typically have any specific side effects from the pharmaceutical agent. It doesn't you know, cause itching or rash or low blood counts or anything. But the ramifications of having a low testosterone are extensive, and we've had videos on that about hot flashes and weight gain and loss of muscle and loss of libido, loss of calcium from your bones, and on and on and on. All of that is due to the loss of testosterone. It's not from the medicine itself. And so the difference is, in terms of side effects between some of the medicines I've mentioned are relatively um, minor or even non-existent. Uh, the only exception I think would be, we should mention how quickly testosterone recovers when the treatment is stopped. Uh, there can be a, a, a lag when the medicines wear off before the testicles wake up and start making testosterone again. A new oral preparation called Orgovix, newer, it's been out for a little while now, seems to have less lag in the testosterone recovery when the treatment is uh, terminated. So when we say less lag, what would you know something like Lupron V versus something like Orgovix? Well, the lag is going to be greater in men that have been on treatment for longer and longer periods. So if someone gets a four-month Lupron shot, wears off after four months, it's probably going to be two or three months before their testosterone's back in full force. But with something like Orgovix, the testosterone might be back within four to six weeks. So upon embarking on any of these treatments, I've heard you say in other videos that patients should get their testosterone checked. Is that something you would say specifically in first-generation hormone therapy as well? Yes. I, when we're beginning a new treatment that 
works by lowering testosterone. You can see how if the testosterone was al already very low, that that treatment uh, might not produce the kind of results that you would hope for. Most men have adequate or normal testosterone levels, but occasionally you'll run across people who already are hypogonadal or have low testosterone. And our expectations with these medications are gonna be diminished. If we're lowering an already low testosterone, I don't think we would see the kind of results that we would hope for. Now, when it comes to PSA response, would you say that that's pretty equal across the board as far as timing as well? Yes, although with Firmagodin Orgovix, because they cause the testosterone levels to drop immediately, the PSA after a month will probably be a little bit lower. But ultimately, after two or three months, these things equal out and you'll have exactly the same outcomes. Is there ever a time where a patient is on one type of first-generation hormone therapy and you'd switch them for a different reason? If we were starting people on Firmagon to uh, gain that rapid decline in, in uh, testosterone, uh, we often would switch people over to some of the other products because Firmagon only comes in one-month increments. So. Uh, Lupron and Trellstar and Eligard, uh, these other products, you can give them in the last three, four, or six months, which is just more convenient. And what about affordability? Is one drug more affordable than another? Yes, I think injectable medicines are more consistently covered by Medicare. Oral medicines like Orgovix, if patients haven't purchased a secondary uh, insurance, they may find that the out-of-pocket expenses are quite a bit more. And of course, for private insurances, uh, that, that's a little hard to predict. What about people who have maybe some pre-existing conditions? You know, are there any concerns about heart issues, diabetes that you know, may counteract with these drugs? I'm glad you raised that subject. There is a large trial ongoing right now uh, comparing Orgovix with the more traditional LHRH agonists uh, like Lupron and Eligard and Trellstar to see if there is a lower incidence of cardiac issues. This was a signal that came out as a secondary thing in the Orgovix approval process, but it wasn't really what they were looking for, so the validity of those conclusions is, is a little bit soft. But uh, a large trial is now being initiated to compare Orgovix versus these other things to see if there is a lower incidence of cardiac issues. The cardiac issues that I see related to all these medicines is directly a result of the weight gain that, and the higher blood pressures, that uh, uh, higher blood sugars that occur when people put on weight. And this does lead to greater cardiovascular problems. I have not seen increased cardiovascular issues in the men that have been careful and diligent and disciplined in their exercise and their diet and keeping their weight under control. So I was watching some of our older conference videos and you know, t listening to Dr. Moya talk about the weight gain that is associated with hormone therapy and how you know, even before going on hormone therapy, if somebody can lose some weight and keep off that adipose tissue, how important that is. How do you manage you know, people who are gaining weight on hormone therapy in your practice? Primarily, historically, it's been just with counseling. When you uh, embark upon testosterone-lowering therapy, that your metabolism is going to slow down. And if you just stay on the same diet that you've always eaten, you're probably going to put on weight. And you're going to put on weight much quicker and more easily than you can imagine. I counsel them to try and, and uh, stay ahead of it. It's always a difficult thing, however, and uh, we're excited about these new medicines that are coming out, like Ozempic for weight loss, and uh, that may prove to be a, a real assistance for our patients who go on hormone therapy now that we have these new weight loss medications that really work. So I know in the second generation hormone therapies, there are some that cause more fatigue than others. Are there any sort of first generation hormone therapies from the ones that you mentioned that do have more of a fatigue issue? Because I know when we're talking about weight loss or working out and retaining muscle fatigue and even getting up during that process can be quite difficult. I think you're referring specifically to Xtandi, which can cause a greater degree of fatigue than other testosterone-lowering medications. Uh, it doesn't cause it in all people, it's just a subgroup of people. But the answer is no. The fatigue that comes about from low testosterone is from the low testosterone itself, not from the medicines. There's not some secondary effect from these first-generation uh, testosterone-lowering medications. But the fatigue is, of course, a real issue with low testosterone because men tend to lose muscle. And, uh, of course, we counsel them to embark upon a rigorous weight training program to uh, 
to try and maintain their muscles so they have a sense of normalcy while they're on the treatment. Speaking of fatigue, a couple years ago I was, you know, going through Yahoo News and all of a sudden they said that hormone therapy is associated with Alzheimer's. And you did a video on this, but can you lightly cover the fatigue issues that, and the mental fog that can come from hormone therapy? The example I use is uh, uh, our memory, which is what they call Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and many of these men, they're looking at database, uh, uh, you know, computer algorithms of people on insurance and whatnot, and they can see that people have reduced mental performance while they're on these medicines, testosterone-lowering medicines. And uh, these are people that are on testosterone-lowering medicines indefinitely. There is definitely a decline in memory that is associated when your testosterone is low, and this is primarily related to the fatigue that we've already been talking about. It's not that the mind doesn't work, it's just that the energy that it takes to remember stuff is reduced. The example I use is uh, meeting someone for breakfast and being introduced to a couple new people and maybe relatively effortlessly remembering their names versus uh, going to a cocktail party after a long day at work and it's eight o'clock at night and you get introduced to a couple of people and you, what were their names? You know, it's just, you don't have the energy to really focus. And uh, that goes away when you stop the hormone therapy, the testosterone comes back, your energy and strength returns and it's reversible. So Alzheimer's is not a good characterization of what uh, testosterone lowering therapy does. It makes people fatigued and tired and it makes it more difficult to re remember things, but it doesn't advance the irreversible process that we associate with the word Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Dr. Schultz, for answering this. We have so many patients who have commented and written into us and asked, you know, in comparison when it comes to choosing a first-generation hormone therapy, whether it's in the short term for radiation therapy or in a longer form when it comes to a recurrence, you know, which one works better? And it sounds like, you know, from what you're saying, it really makes sense to look at the side effects and the management of that because it's coming from not the, you know, the um, pharmaceutical drug but the low testosterone and treating those side effects from the low testosterone is the most important thing because obviously we want patients to have the best quality of life as possible. And so I appreciate the um, information and thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching this video on first generation hormone therapies. I think a couple things to point out are since Dr. Schulz mentioned that these types of first generation, you know, hormone therapies can lower testosterone equally, they all kind of work in a very similar way and to a similar degree. The things to pay attention to are your lifestyle and the side effects that you're going to be handling and also really the convenience, you know, if an oral works better for you than an injectable, maybe a three month shot, six month shot versus anything else, you know, you want to look at these little nuances and talk to your doctor about those nuances. You know, how many doctor's visits am I going to need to go to? And then when it comes to the side effects of things, you want to look at what you can do to mitigate those beforehand. If it's radiation to the chest so there's not breast enlargement, if it's, you know, getting on a workout plan now before you embark upon that so you can build up some muscle, or going on maybe a vegan diet or a life, really a diet that works with your lifestyle to make sure that you're prepared for those side effects. I think as much work as we can do before, the better the outcome. Now, please remember that we are here for you. We have a helpline that is a they're prostate cancer patients that have been through this experience. They've been on hormone therapy and they can answer a lot of your questions firsthand. So you can visit them at pcri.org forward slash helpline. You just fill out the form and they'll call you and you can have a conversation with a real person who has been through this situation. Please remember we're a nonprofit. So if you'd like to donate and join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. But the thing I want you to remember most of all is you're not alone. We are here for you. And if you have questions, please reach out. Thank you very much.